This is Secret Life of Simples. We think that we are getting better each day, and we uh, have come from a more primitive society, but we are getting better every day and becoming more superior in knowledge and technology, when actually, in point of fact, we are digressing. We are moving away from what we were thousands and thousands of years ago. And I am of the opinion that our history has been vastly changed and so that we don't really know the history of mankind on this earth. We are finding that there are temples on the ocean floor, pyramids, Machu Picchu, uh, Chichen Itza, incredible structures of temples and knowledge which is displayed about the universe, about astrology, and the astronomical truths about the universe. The ancient, truly prehistoric and ancient people, they knew all about it. We are trying to catch up today to what they knew tens of thousands of years ago. We are finding everything that we think we know. It's already been here tens of thousands of years ago. There was a higher life forms on this earth than we are. I have a vision of from the ancient world were not what we would refer to as humans. I think that they looked like us maybe or in some ways like us. They were far superior. Uh, the people, whoever they were, that built the Great Pyramid of, of Egypt had an extraordinarily brilliant understanding of the Earth, of our solar system, of the galaxy we are in, and all of the esoteric and profoundly important knowledge about life and the spirit of man and where we've come from and where we're going. And so it all implies that there was a far higher civilization all around the world. And the best science we have today are admitting that we're just trying to catch up with what the ancient peoples I already knew. These ancient brilliant builders and teachers, they didn't grow into that. They came in fully developed. When you look at Egypt, Egypt is a, is a classic example. If you go to the very beginnings of Egypt, it was already, it came in as an extraordinarily brilliant society of builders and knowledge, and then eventually devolved into what Egypt is today. But there was a time when Egypt was in its prime when it was founded. So it didn't kind of work up to, as we say, we're working up to uh, some kind of a, of a wonderful future. But Egypt didn't do that. It came in at its pinnacle. How is that possible? The only way it's possible is because when whoever we call, whoever this was that we call the ancient Egyptians, they were not of this world to start with. They came here knowing all that we still are trying to find out. So it implies that they were not from here. They came in fully understanding the whole universe. And they were able to do things with their temples and with the way that they laid out the pyramids. They knew things we didn't know and we still don't know. And we're still trying today in metaphysics and in, in occultism uh, religion, we're trying to find the bottom line that the ancient peoples, they already knew. There is obviously a high science behind the life period. And all of the, the best of the best in our human life, like astrology and alchemy and all of the other what I call sciences. Others would say, no, they're just belief systems. No, they're sciences because when you really look into them, you begin to see that they're telling you things that scientists are just now beginning to realize. There's a higher 
occult or hidden. The word occult simply means hidden. And so there's obviously a higher science or an occult science behind mankind's ability to contemplate the spiritual aspects of life on the earth. There's lots of ancient people already knew what we're trying to find out today. We know that, uh, that the pyramids, say in Mexico and Central and South America, along with the, the great temples around the world, were solar temples, they were the center for astronomy. And so the ancient peoples were not looking for spiritual uh, answers as such. They were looking at the actual universe and trying to figure out where we are, what we're doing, and what is the universe. And so from that uh, inquiry into the actual setup of the way the universe is, uh, operates, then from there, they began to suspect that there was some kind of an unwritten, powerful laws in the universe that guided the sun, the moon, the planets, and the whole uh, of the solar system. They start off scientifically just looking for answers to what we're doing here, what is this? And from there, they begin to develop religions or philosophies, alchemy, uh, astrology, medicine, and then human interrelationships. And then from there, you get into all the other metaphysical pursuits. And that's why today the world is half scientific and yet half spiritual but the spirituality did not come first. There's the regular interest in how the world works. That's what the ancient peoples built those great uh, observatories for. They just wanted to study the heavens. But in doing so, it didn't take long till around the world, mankind that was viewing the heavens for science began to suspect that there is something else going on here. And now comes the, the world of spirituality. As I said, the word occult simply means hidden. So there are many hidden sciences that the really bright people who are looking into these things know about. But generally speaking, the world of mankind is not really well informed about alchemy and about these sciences of, of spirituality. But that's growing now too. So people are beginning to wake up to the spiritual relevance to your life of spiritual subjects. I think that there is something there that needs to be looked at, this whole idea of where man has come from, where he is right now, and ultimately where is he going to go with his knowledge and with his life and experiences? What is the reason why we're having the experiences that each of, each of us do have each day, we're all growing and hopefully we are growing far more intelligent and, and insightful and looking at the spiritual aspects of our life. That's a very important feature of being alive is to not just live for the material world today, but start asking serious questions about where were you before you were born? And where will you be after you leave here, this earth? And what is the reason for our human life? And why are we learning so many hard lessons the hard way? There seems to be some sort of an overshadowing presence in the universe that men have called God, or some sort of an ultimate a spiritual presence that is leading or directing our evolution. And if that be the case, which it seems to be, then maybe there is some hope yet for the human race. If enough people begin to wake up, spiritually speaking, and begin to look at their lives spiritually, then there might be hope for us yet, because this is why we are in the shape we're in today because we are living in this me generation. And this generation that only cares about feeding itself and taking care of itself and enjoying itself, never realizing you have responsibilities to the world that you live in and to help, to help your fellow man to, to grow and to help educate other people. 
I can speak for myself in relation to the idea of why do we seek wisdom and spiritual knowledge. I have always understood that I have questions within myself that others can't answer. And for me, looking at these questions, uh, they make a lot of sense to me. Why this and why that? And why does this happen? So I, I have learned that to think deeply on these spiritual questions of life opened me up to a whole world of knowledge because I realize how much I don't know. And I am also well aware of the spiritual implications of the laws in the universe around us. There are certain things you can do in this world and things you cannot do. And you will pay, you will pay a terrible price for doing the things you're not supposed to do. And I am totally convinced that there is some sort of an overshadowing force in the world that wants us to grow. And this concept is even in Christianity where you're talking about you hear talk about good angels and bad demons and bad angels, uh, implying that there are good forces, unseen forces out there, and then there are bad. And we know that there is something called good and bad, and there are certain things in all society which are known to be bad and evil. I tend to think that there is something to this idea of reincarnation. And I, the reason why is because it is pretty much agreed upon by so many of the ancient religions and philosophers and great teachers of the world. My gut feeling is, is that we do come into this world with baggage from other lifetimes. And, and this is why we begin to become who we are because of who we were before. Another part of that story is that we before we came and incarnated on this earth that we chose a particular lifestyle, we're told and uh, given to understand, and that we chose our own parents before we came here. I understand the spirit world enough, enough to know that it's very possible that we, and we were in a spiritual state and then we incarnated into a physical state. Now the rest of it is uh, up for speculation. I am totally convinced that there are very legitimate and real uh, otherworldly, I choose to call it, otherworldly forces, spirit forces, demonic forces. There, of that, there is no doubt in my mind about because I've had too many personal experiences that tells me and proves to me that somebody's watching us, somebody's watching the human family. The very history of how America was founded the, and the founding fathers, so to speak, what vision they had when they were putting together the idea to found this country. What was their vision? You know, what were they thinking? And, and what were they actually working toward? And now that gets into the, uh, the, the subject of Freemasonry, to the secret sciences like alchemy and political. There's a lot of political stuff in there too. You have to be careful about secret societies because these different societies become very powerful and very wealthy, but they have an agenda. They have a particular agenda that they're trying to uh, create or to uh, bring into being and therefore they will build the whole world around you. And you accept what, you know, when you're a child, a baby, you come into the world and you just accept everything. And if you don't grow up, you just, as a grown person, you just accept whatever there is because that's the way it is. But that's not the way it is. And you keep in mind that there were secret societies that were involved in founding this country. And who were they? And what were they trying to do? You have to know secret societies to understand why there are so many different symbols and emblems in Washington, D.C. and around the world. Because there's different groups, societies, 
that are working towards certain agenda and they are putting symbols out that represents their agenda. We know that even in gangs, that when you drive through neighborhoods like in Los Angeles and there are scribblings on the walls of gangs, that those symbols mean something. And if you're in a gang, you know what those symbols mean. They're telling you something. Whoever is controlling that area, that's their symbols. And that's a whole study that you need to get into, studying the occult symbols of power in this world. They're used to, as a means to communicate and to influence you or to connect you with the spiritual world that they represent. So let's start with a religious symbol and that is an ancient Phoenician god that was very important in the Middle East some 5,000 years ago. That god was called Dagon, D-A-G-O-N. Dagon was a fish god. Interesting how he has evolved into today's world of religion. Dagon is still very much alive with the world today. First of all, everyone knows that Christianity is founded on the worship of Jesus Christ that is accepted around the world. And most people believe that the Vatican is the center for the worship of Jesus, the God of Christianity. Uh, however, millions of people also believe uh, is that the Pope of Rome is leading the Christians to worship Jesus throughout the world. But my question is, who is the Pope leading the worship of? The first symbol that I want to talk about is the headdress that the Pope or the Bishop of Rome wears. Uh, that headdress is very interesting and has one, uh, quite a history to it. That Pope's headdress is called a uh, Pope's mitre. The Pope's mitre, uh, we've seen it in many different shapes, but they're always basically the same shape, the Pope's mitre. It's an official headdress worn only by the Pope, or supposedly only by the Pope. But we need to understand that that symbol goes back at least 5,000 years. So what we need to know and what we need to keep in mind is that this strange and interesting headdress of, of hat that the Pope wears is impacted by a, a god named Dagon. Dagon was a god of the Philistines, and Dagon comes from the word dag, which means fish. So Dagon was a fish god. And here we have pictures of another fish god named Anis, the same god but it was worship in different countries under different names. So we have, we have a God who's half fish and half man, or men who wear the garbs of a fish in their, in their religious uh, celebration. So here in the Jewish Encyclopedia, under the heading of Dagon, you will see a picture of uh, the priest of Dagon or the God himself, and he's wearing a fish head and the body of a fish down his back. So now we see the Pope's headdress. On the top is the Pope's mitre. But when turned, you then see he's actually wearing a fish head, the fish god Dagon, because he's representing the worship of an ancient Phoenician god. So this is why today Christians on the back of their cars, you will see, have a fish symbol. I'm thinking that uh, that's to denote them as Christians worshiping Jesus. No, it's a fish symbol because it's denoting Dagon, the fish god. The significance is Dagon was a very important mystical god to the ancient peoples in the Middle East, in Babylonia, Sumeria, Phoenicia, Cana. And that very powerful mystical god is still dominating the spirit and the intellectual thinking of religion even to today. So it's not Jesus that's influencing the Vatican and the Pope. Uh, it's Dagon, the fish god. That's the importance of this. The point being is that religion is, comes to the world in the age of Pisces. And Pisces is, of course, the two fish 
of the constellation of Pisces. But Dagon is 5,000 years old. Another one of the symbols I find to be very interesting that's used quite often around the world today, but a lot of people don't know uh, the, how it's connected to the religions of today, and that is a magic wand. Magic wands, we, we've heard in stories galore from children from childhood days about magicians who use a magic wand. Well, the magic wand is just what it says it is. So it's a some sort of a branch of a tree that has been consecrated and, and made holy by blessings from, from the, the priest. And now it has a magical quality that can do things that, other, that humans can't do. The Druid priests, they used the wood of a holly tree. They used Hollywood. And that's what we get the term today, Hollywood, in the magic of Hollywood. Today we have Hollywood, uh, we have Mickey Mouse waving a magic wand. On the left side we also have actual real magic wands as they are made today in Europe. And of course orchestra leaders, and orchestra conductors, they, they lead the, the music with uh, a magic wand. And a lot of people haven't thought about that, but that's what it is, a magic wand. So here we have a picture of Moses where he is conjuring up the spirits in the universe with a magic wand. That's very interesting, Moses with a magic wand. Uh, in the ancient Roman Empire, the most important god uh, at the height of Rome's power in the world was a god named Mithra. Mithra was a sun god. And according to the Roman explanation of their god, he was not only a sun god, but he did his miracles with a magic wand. Now here we have Jesus raising Lazarus from the tomb. And you will see that Jesus is using a magic wand. How many Christians know that, that all throughout Europe and around the world, Christian churches have Jesus working his miracles with uh, magic wands. A lot of people don't know that. You know? So we, we hear all about the, uh, the magical things that Jesus was able to do. But here in the actual churches, we see that Jesus is doing his miracles with a magic wand. The importance of this is to point out that people do not realize that in Christianity, uh, the understanding in the ancient world and in the medieval world was that these religious figures like Jesus were doing their, their miracles with magic wands. But it's actually legitimate, du jour, real magical system of controlling people's minds and directing their spirits and their hearts and, and being able to direct our, our civilization through magical symbols and magical words. Another symbol that I find to be very interesting is uh, in Star Trek there was a Mr. Spock. And if you remember Mr. Spock was always giving a hand sign and he was said to be a Vulcan. First of all, his hand sign was actually a religious symbol in Judaism, uh, in which it was a blessing to the congregation in Judaism. It's called the Kohen symbol. This symbol is a Jewish blessing symbol. But where did it come from? It comes from the split hoof of a goat it goes back to the split hoof of a goat because we're talking about the age of Aries, the ram, when the Jews were under the age of the ram, the ram or the lamb of God. And so that's why today we call Jesus the lamb of God. We're going back to the constellation of uh, Aries, the ram. Nebo even said that he accepted that sign and used it but because it was a sign from his rabbi, and he thought it was a very interesting symbol, so he just used it in Star Trek. I'm sure he probably knew the, uh, the, the meaning of the sign, but that's where he said he got it from. Another subject which is interesting and very relevant today 
is a symbol called the fasci or the fasces. On the, back of a, uh, on the back of an American dime, you will see a bundle of sticks tied together, and it has an axe head with it. That is uh, called a fasci, and this is an ancient Etruscan symbol that was adopted by the Roman Empire to symbolize Rome's power. It's an old ancient Etruscan symbol, but it's very important to the Roman Empire. Rome said, ancient Rome's philosophy was, if it's just one stick, and you, can, you can beat somebody with a stick, but it's not going to hurt them, really. But if you've got two or three sticks, now, it, it, now it's going to be a, a little bit heavier deal. But if you get five or six sticks and tie them together as one, now you've got serious strength now. Now when you beat somebody with uh, six or eight sticks tied together, that's, that's serious. And so then they put a hatchet head on it because uh, an axe head always represented in almost all the ancient cultures of the world accepted that the axe head represented the presence of God. God was the great hatchet. The, you know, he's giving you the axe. And so the hatchet head represented God and the bundle of sticks represented a coalition of troops. So when Rome would go into some uh, to another country to overtake it, they would take troops from this group and troops from that group and put them all together. Now you've got a strong force. It's not just Roman. It's all kinds of other countries are, are with you. And so that's why we hear today, when we hear the presidents talking about during the Middle East, they have a coalition uh, of, of countries, not just America. We have uh, other countries with us. It's a coalition. Coalition is another name for fasci, which is a symbol for world fascism, when you can get all the countries together and, and have them all, you know, all doing the same thing, all of the countries uh, marching to the same tune. Now you've got a strong military force. The fasci was, car was usually carried officially behind Caesar. He would be on, in the front of the parade or whatever, and there would be what is called lectors behind him, and they would be holding the fasci, symbolizing Caesar's power over life and death. He is the man. He's the boss. And so the lectors would be standing on both sides of Caesar on the altars when Caesar was speaking, holding those fasci so that the Roman people know he is, he has the right to life and death. So here you'll see in World War II uh, with Mussolini on the left and his symbol for his government, a fasci. Well, of course, he's Italian and that goes back to the Roman Empire. And so here we have uh, a Nazi, as you'll see, the swastika and the, and the Nazi eagle, like the American uh, bald eagle. Uh, but you'll see the two fasci on each side of the swastika. This is because Germany was in league with it, Italy during the Second World War. Mussolini had in mind to do the same thing Adolf Hitler wanted to do was to create a new world order. And so Mussolini saw that new world order as being Catholic, as to be Roman, while, uh, while Germany saw it to be uh, German and, and uh, not Italian. But the two together, uh, I suppose they figured they'll, they'll work that out once they take over the world. Well, Mussolini actually, according to history books, actually thought of himself as Caesar. He saw himself in his position of power at the time of the Second World War as Caesar of the ancient Roman Empire, and therefore it would be right that he would pick the symbol that Caesar used to show his power. And so that's why the, the fasci became so fashionable in Italy. But the two fasci, you will also see on the uh, wall behind the, uh, where the Speaker of the House sits when the President's making a, a speech. The United States has, uh, has uh, secret societies uh, in their government and behind the government are very powerful secret societies that see itself, these societies see themselves as the, as the promoters and, the, and, the, and to generate a new world order. All countries copy each other. 
the fascists copied the Etruscans, uh, the Romans copied the Greeks, and the Greeks copied the, the Egyptians, and that's just the way humans are. As much as we change, uh, the more we stay the same. We're all still adopting the same symbols that we adopted under the Egyptian Empire. We're still using those symbols today, pyramids. And Let's talk about the pyramid, and we all recognize that there's uh, three beautiful pyramids on what is called the Giza Plateau in, in Egypt. But my question is, there's only one of the three of those pyramids is referred to as the Great Pyramid. First of all, you need to know that the pyramid that's directly behind the Sphinx uh, is not the Great Pyramid. It is a Great Pyramid in Egypt, but it is not the Great Pyramid. This is the Great Pyramid of Egypt. How many sides does the Great Pyramid have? Well, you would think if there's four sides, and then there's the bottom as a side, so it would be five-sided pyramid. But actually, in point of fact, no, the Great Pyramid is nine sides. Why? Because on the first day of the spring equinox or the fall equinox, if you are in the right place at the right moment when the sun hits the pyramid, you will see that each side is divided down the middle, but so subtle that when you're there at the pyramid, you don't notice it. But on the first day of spring and autumn, you will see the Great Pyramid is divided down the middle. And so here again is another picture of the pyramid from above on that special day, that special hour, when the sun's hitting it just right. And so each side is two sides. Therefore, if uh, you, you got not four sides, but eight, plus the bottom side makes nine. So how many people know that the Great Pyramid of Egypt has nine sides? It's strange, but it seems as that no one really knows why the Egyptians took so much effort to divide each side of the pyramid so perfectly and so brilliantly and such uh, that you would not see it until a particular day at a particular time. We call it the Great Pyramid because there's a lot of important stuff uh, implied in that, in, that, in that pyramid. And the other pyramids do not even come close. They don't have anything like what's in that Great Pyramid. That is one act by itself. It's the only one. That's why we today call it the Great Pyramid. Uh, the next subject we'd like to look at for a moment is the cornerstone in the Christian religion. Christians will tell you that the church, uh, that in the church of Christianity, Jesus is referred to as uh, the, the, the cornerstone of the church. But that's not exactly correct. The actual scripture says that he's not the cornerstone. It says Jesus is the chief cornerstone. A cornerstone is what it's said to be, just a stone at the corner of a building. But wherever you set that cornerstone up, you're going to line all the other stones up with it. So it's the first one that decides where this building is going to be aiming. And so Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. But Jesus is actually referred to as the chief cornerstone. And that's important because a totally different understanding of the word chief cornerstone. Chief cornerstone means a triangle placed on top of a pyramid. A little, if you take a perfect flawless pyramid triangle and you cut off the top, it itself is a pyramid, but it's a tiny one that sits on top of the big one. That tiny little pyramid is called a pyramidion. A pyramidion is a tiny pyramid sitting on top of the big pyramid. That's what the Bible says Jesus is. He is a pyramidion. He's not a cornerstone. He's a chief cornerstone, which is on the top of a pyramid. That was the genius of the ancient Egyptians. And so today, the more we have changed, the more we stay the same. And so we use the same symbols that Caesar used. We use the same symbols that the Babylonians used. It's because Mankind 
is hardwired, so to speak, to realize the importance of very powerful symbols to represent your civilization and who you are, and where you come from, and what your destiny is. It's everywhere from religion to governments to military, commerce, banking. Symbols is as a way to communicate with the world. I'm Jordan Maxwell, and thank you for watching. This is Secret Life of Symbols.